Hi, I'm Rolf Karlstad and I'm an astrophotographer. And I use a piece of software that not a lot of people use. It's possible that many people have tried, uh, and equally possible that just about all those people decided to just put Iris back on the back burner because it's kind of weird and the interface is very well let's just say it's uh, Windows XP maybe at best I believe it f was first published in 1999 and I've been using it for about <laughs> that about since that date um, this is a picture of M51 the Whirlpool Galaxy and I put this together in Iris using uh, 68 two-minute exposures and what I'd like to do right now is just walk through it um, to try to demystify iris a little bit because it's well it, it's really easy to use <laughs> the entire list of this commands window demonstrates that immediately I'm sure you can tell it's trivial there's nothing to think about here <laughs> And I'm being completely sarcastic because there's a, a deep set of commands that you can learn. There are a lot of things that can be done from the menus. Um, and, and I use the menus. And um, I also use the command line. I don't want to go too deep into any particular tangent right now. So why don't we just get started? And I'll show you sort of the basics of um, starting from scratch. Uh, well... Actually, now that we're here, uh, this is the IRIS website. You can find it right there. Uh, the old version of the same website is available here. And on that website, the commands list summary that I put together. There are many tutorials. These are all tutorials. They'll walk you right through what you need to do if you can get past the learning curve. And here, this is a commands list that I put together a long time ago, which is almost as recent as anything else. B bear in mind, the links are all broken, and that's a terrible commands list. But if you kind of know what you're looking for, this PDF file, if you put it in your Iris folder and hit help, um, you can search for... Well, if you have some idea of what you're trying to do, you can use search, and you can find information in that. So. Uh, the other night, I took my new scope, you know, my new mount out with my scope, and I um, took some pictures. And this is actually the uh, my iris working folder. Um, I have a one of the very important things. This is very fundamental about iris is that every single project you just have to have a working folder for. So if I was to scroll down this, you'll see that it kind of goes back in time. And, and every kind of project has its own working folder. This folder, I've already been working on this project, and so, for example, here we can see that I've, I've already got a output image, and I, I think I showed that at the beginning of the video. Uh, but more importantly, at the very beginning, I had imported my offset files, bias, if you will, uh, the darks, uh, some flats, uh, and then I started importing my actual images that I was using. Uh, the lights, I guess, the exposures. And I got 68 of them. They were, well, exposure time doesn't show there. In the original folder that this stuff came from, I also try to organize my stuff. I, this night, I, I, I got some darks, some bias, some flats. I took some pictures of the moon. You know, you know, right, as people will do. Take a picture of the moon. Great, okay. Um, but I also took some pictures of the globular cluster M3 and um, galaxy M106 and M51 and a single picture of a two-minute exposure time. It looks about like that. So, you know, you see that on your camera screen, I suppose, and you might think to yourself, well, <sighs> that's not very impressive and I can't do anything with that. Well, y well, yeah, you, you can. If you look at this at one-to-one -one zoom, which is the same scale that this should be, <coughs> you'll see the same structures. It's just that with a purely linear exposure, even as this previewer tries to make it 
stretched so the human eye can see it. There's just not a lot to see. But that was actually part of my goal. That was not to blow out these these uh, uh, these structures here that are so bright relative to the rest of it. But it's time for me to move on. I I, I was really I had a goal. Hello everybody. I had a goal that I was going to try to keep this video to one cut. I just want to just talk and keep it simple. But obviously at this point I'm going off the rails and I just need to focus. So if I want to keep this video as one thing, let's just get right into it. I'm going to start a new version of Iris so we start from scratch. Right away you've got this threshold slider. This top threshold slider sets your high level. Anything, anything that's brighter than that will show as pure white. Anything that's darker than this slider down here will show as pure black. And this is purely for visualization. It actually doesn't affect the image in any way. Uh, the most important thing in Iris is you have to set a working folder. I showed that earlier. That's set here. Um, and that was this folder here. And you'll see that these paths are the same. Every folder, every project, one to one. One, one folder per project. It's very smart. And uh, there's scripting. That's a little bit of an advanced topic maybe for this video. And we'll get into that, but you maybe have those set to be the same. Oops. There are three file types available for the file extension type in Iris. These two are identical, with the exception that the extension is uh, different. This is preferred, the PIC format. It's incompatible with anything else. It's Iris-specific, but it's the fastest. And I don't think we're going to talk about um, star catalog paths and USB control for telescopes at this point, or the old classic LX200. Um, there are these little weird Windows 2000 style icons in Iris, and they do various things. The important ones are this one right here, uh, which looks like a little command line, which is exactly what that is. If you click that, you'll get a command window. And then you can type stuff, and if you type it, it'll, well, stuff is an unknown command, but if you do know a command, like, uh, It'll give you the syntax for that command. So that's pretty straightforward. Again, the aforementioned sort of um, command line reference stuff, if you download that and put it in your Iris folder and click Help, then that'll just pull up that commands list. And you can, instead of, you know, I know what I'm looking for. So the register command, for example, which is what I just typed in, if, if you didn't just want to type in the and, and get a uh, type in the com command and get an error and get the raw syntax. Then you can actually kind of look at at what the philosophy behind that command is all about. Another important thing here is this little camera icon. It looks like a camera. Uh, most of this stuff is obsolete. This program was originally written to control an open source CCD camera with a KAF 400, 1600, or 3200 chip um, CCD. Nowadays, it has a lot of digital camera control options. Uh, well, digital camera raw file processing options. My specific camera happens to use the Adobe DNG format for its RAWs, so that's easy. I can select that. Linear is honestly the best here. These other methods, uh, they take more time and they're more invasive and it's just not worth it. So stick with linear, white balance is kind of non-applicable and none of the rest of this stuff matters. But just make sure that you set the type of camera you have here. If you have a Canon, you can see there's a few choices, or a Nikon, there's a few choices. So uh, you'll just kind of have to troubleshoot. The biggest thing that'll happen if you select the wrong camera is that the uh, alignment of the Bayer matrix will be incorrect and your image will come out with the wrong color being selected for the wrong pixels. So, you've got your camera selected, you've got a working path selected here in settings, and the next thing to do is just to import some images. And that's as simple as going to digital photo, decode raw images, and then it opens up this dialog box. If, if it gets hidden for some reason, you just kind of have to click the iris icon again and this window will reappear. It's annoying. It's a very old piece of software, uh, most recently updated in 2010, and it's just not going to change. It'll never be updated again. It doesn't matter, though. It works just fine. 
in this original folder that I showed, I had my various images here. So if I wanted to import my darks, these were my darks. So I take some darks. You know, normally I would select them all, but I'm working in the interest of, of speed here. And you can't just hit enter. If you do, the well, the dialog box will go away. So you got to go do that again and then drag those files back in. And remember not to hit enter and don't be too speedy and you have to hit the CFA button. These other options are available, but just ignore them. Pretend like they don't exist. Those options don't exist. The only option you want to ever click here is CFA. That converts it as a raw, black and white monochrome, pulls it into a 16-bit signed integer color space. Iris uses a signed integer, so you can have minus and positive values between roughly 32,000 and negative and 32,000 in the positive. And when you're done with that, the window will pop back up, the output window will show you how many images you just converted, and then that image will be available for you um, with a index. So if you imported four images, uh, dark one will be the first of them, and dark four will be the last of them. Four images, simple, non-padded index appended to the end of the base file name. Just as simple as that. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, you, you want to import your darks, your bias files, you want to pull those suckers in there, right? And your, uh, and your flats, you know, get some flats, like pick the right exposure of flats and pull those in there. Except not all at once. You can't do that. You, you can't do them like that. It's not how it works. You just have to do them all one at a time. So if you want to pull your flats in, you pull in some flats. And then you call it flat, or whatever you choose to call it. I like to keep my naming simple. You hit CFA, boom, and you're done. I'm not going to do that because I've actually kind of done a little bit of work ahead of time. So we're going to skip ahead to try to, in the interest of keeping this short, and talk about the pre-processing menu. Nah, not quite yet. So you made a, you've got a dark. You want to do a, uh, you want to make a dark. There are menu options to make your offset. That's also called a bias. So let's say we had a, you called your files bias, for example, and you did not know how many you had, so you just typed in a thousand. It'll tell you there's not more than eight. Well, there's not more than seven. Couldn't find seven. So uh, again, just kind of short circuiting the whole learning process here. Go back, make your bias again. Uh, there's only seven files. Click OK. It's going to do a median stack on those seven files for you. And then when you're done, you save it as a file. Now, in this case, I would probably choose bias. However, that's another rabbit hole, and I'm not really going to go down it right now. I'm just going to kind of say, this is how you make your raw files. If you want to make a dark, the traditional way is your bias is the offset. I use the word bias. Some people use the word offset. Your dark, of course, I imported these files earlier. I named them dark, is your dark. And then you choose the number that you want to make. We're just going to do five to keep it simple. You could do a summation, uh, uh, an average, or a, me a median. Median is the traditional way to do it. And then it just does that. And then you save that when it's done, here, as soon as it's done. And I save it as a, it, whatever. Look, I'm not trying to get all in your face about file names, but I would call that dark. And then the, if you look at the statistics of that file, you'll probably see, in this case, there were some negative values. That's not normal. You can clip those with the clip min command. Uh, and then 0, 0 are usually basically the most, how shall I say, obvious input parameters for that command. And then after you do that, if you look at that, there will be no more negative values. The threshold, again, it's just a visualization slider letting you see things like, like these little hot pixels. If you want to find the hot pixels, and again, I'm super duper going down a rabbit hole here, but uh, you set a threshold, you want to know the syntax, you just type it, hit enter. 
maybe pick a file, uh, uh, you know, hot list is my list file. That's the file name of the hot pixels. And then set a threshold, like say mm, 50. At a threshold of 50, it found 824 hot pixels and saved them to this file in XY coordinates called hot list. Right, so uh, flats, sort of the same deal. You, you do a flat. I have a uh, bias offset file for these flats that I called, I believe, flat dark. Uh, the, these were 14-bit raw images, and the 14-bit median normalization value that I've found works well is 6553. And let's, again, just stick with this 5 to keep it quick. So I, I enter those parameters. It subtracts the offset from the flats. It normalizes them. And then it does a median stack. And, 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 and then here's the image. You can zoom in and out with these other buttons here. This is zoom out. This is zoom in. This is one power zoom. You can see the Bayer matrix here. And if you want to convert this to color, it's as simple as going to the Convert CFA Image menu, and it'll then convert that to color. The sky is blue, so this was blue. Um, most selection commands only work if you're in one power zoom here, but if I wanted to try to, <laughs> a couple different things here, but um, you can just use the white command, and that'll set the white balance as white for the area of selection. So sort of turning that white. Again, sort of giving a survey here, a little bit survey course of the various things you can do. But what I want to get to by purposes of this demo is pre-processing. So that's step one. Um, the images that I imported, and I've done this already, they were these. They were in the M51 folder. Um, and I picked a couple of these and, uh, and I imported them. You can see it's not instant, but it doesn't take too long to import the files. That was three of them here. Um, and then that file is imported as a raw image just completely raw. It's black and white. It's not been converted to color yet. This is a one-shot color camera, but, uh, you know, um, look, Iris is old and glitchy. <laughs> there's a satellite came through. Uh, you know, there's a lot there, I guess, in one single two-minute raw exposure. And if you did want to convert that to color again, you could just convert that to color and then try to find an area that's actually white or you want to be white you know, and it's always challenging. Maybe the background is the thing you want to set to be white. I don't really enjoy doing color work myself. I eh, terrible. There's also a black command. And then the offset command, because now it's too black. Um, if I were to hit auto, I bet this goes to the negative. So let's just offset that, that by uh, 216. And then if I hit auto again, you'll see that I added an offset of an, a uniform value of 216 to every pixel. Anywho, I don't want to get into the color right now. I'm sorry. Uh, we're just going to kind of forget about that. And I demonstrated that I loaded these pictures. That's what they, I pulled in one. That's what it looked like. Um, now about pre-processing them. So you have your images. I called them, no, I called them, <laughs> that's not a rhyme. I called them M51 with a hyphen. Uh, the offset was bias. The dark was dark. I made these before. You're just going to have to trust me. I do not want them optimized. In this case, the flat's called flat. The cosmetic file's called hot. And the output file is called, in this case, I'm just going to call it my generic throwaway garbage name. Normally, if I was doing this, I'd call it M M51 PR. And in fact, I'll just call it that now because it doesn't really matter. Nothing I'm going to do is going to be impacted by this. Sorry, more rabbit holes. I'm just going to do five of them, and it'll walk. Uh, it'll sort of show you what it does to the images. First thing it's going to do is it'll subtract the bias. The next round, it'll subtract the dark. 
and then it'll divide the result by the flat field, and then it'll do a, a cosmetic correction surrounding the pixels that were marked as hot uh, and recorded in the hot file. The output file will be saved to the same folder as M51PR. Uh, I've already imported all 68 of these. They were called M51, well, 1 through M51-68. And then after I pre-processed them, they were called M51-PR because that's the naming convention that I use. And it's just all up to you. So here's this. Um, it subtracts the bias. Subtracts the dark. It divides by the flat field. This might induce seizures. I'm sorry, I didn't warn anybody in advance. And then pretty soon it's done. And what's happened now is all these files have been saved to the disk. And if I look at this by date modified, you'll see that this batch of images have just been written to the disk here at quarter to two in the morning. Um, and they're all 71 megs, and they are a monochrome image because they have not been converted to color, which again I can do by clicking on this menu here and doing that. Um, so, so now what I have is a bunch of pre-processed images, and I can tell you right now, uh, my tracking was pretty good, but I touched the scope several times to change memory card three, two times. I touched it two times to change memory cards or batteries. And so um, there's, a there's a couple things we can do. I've already done the pre-processing. And they've all been saved as N51PR. It was actually 68 of them. But I don't want to do that again because I've already done it. So that'll just take up more time. I could look at them, though. Um, There were 68 of them. The base file name is Orion-PR. And I just want the fastest delay between them, uh, the minimal delay between them that I can possibly get. Oh, it's not called that. I keep making that mistake. Not called Orion. It's the Whirlpool Galaxy or Messier 51. So, so here we go. So what this has done is it, it's, it's animating it now. It's not really very easy to see because everything is so incredibly dim. So that brings up a point. If you want to view and visualize your threshold, your sequence threshold, which is set by these sliders normally, uh, that sequence was called. And now let's say that I want to make the high threshold 2048, the low threshold 0, and I want to call the output VIS, I guess, being my shortcut for visualization, and we want to do all 68 of them. So, just man, that doesn't work because that's, again, <clears throat> I've clearly run into a little bit of a mental block here uh, with regards to what these files are called and what object I'm looking at. This is, again, M51, and, uh, and and, and now this will actually work, which is which is great. So we'll step through these files one by one, load them into memory, adjust the threshold to the threshold that I set, which was a, a threshold of 2048, and everything above that looks pure white, and then save them all to disk. And that happened pretty quickly, even though they're all 70 megs a piece. Right, so now I can uh, animate that again. And kind of scroll around the whole picture while it does that. Um, and sort of see that, you know, even though this, this, this mount did pretty well there in the beginning, as time went on and I touched it a few times and maybe made some adjustments, it, it wasn't tracking so well there by the end. But... Still, uh, you know, not so bad. Uh, another way to visualize the movement of your exposure set over time, and this was, again, the 68 two-minute exposure. So, you know, it's a uh, well, couple hours. 
and change is a, a command called add max. So I'm going to add uh, the first 68, well there are only 68, but the uh, 68 first index files that have the base name m51-vis and at only the maximum pixel values as are recorded in each frame. Oh golly gee. Iris has two commands for a lot of things. One is, as you can see, the syntax was just add another file. Add max 2, of course, is the one you want because that deals with a sequence. So the tracking is pretty good, pretty linear. Then I touched it, put a new memory card in the in the camera, changed the ba oh, changed the battery again, and you'll see we got a couple couple different uh, couple different mixtures there of, of how everything adds up. So if we just added it in a sort of normal way, that's the add to command. Um, okay, so this command add is simply image one plus image two plus image three dot 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 all the way until the last image in the set and it just sort of like making a multiple exposure I suppose over and over again um, and theoretically speaking if I had left the shutter open for this entire period of time the exposure would have looked something like this now this is obviously a little bit unsuitable and won't really work very well for an astrophoto but over here you can see that there's a star that it moved here and it did this and it did that and if we just kind of draw a box around it, we can actually line the whole set of images up on this star using the register command. The syntax for that is just in, out, and the number. So we're just going to use the pre-processed images. We're not converting them to color. We're not converting them to monochrome. We're not even wasting any time. These are just the uh, non-debayered raw files as captured directly from the camera, calibrated with darks and bias, well, a dark, a bias, and uh, well, really a bias, really, honestly, and a um, cosmetic map, and then a flat field. And we'll line up on these pictures. You don't really actually have to draw a picture around all of them. What's going on with this particular algorithm is as long as the new location of the star is within the area of this box from one star to the next, one frame to the next, it'll, it'll find it. So again, my little syntax here, <coughs> my own shorthand, M51, uh, pre-processed and registered, and there are 68 of them. So this is exciting, and again, if you're prone to seizures, this might cause issues. The screen, Iris kind of flashes the screen a lot. You can mitigate that somewhat by, whoops, by kind of just making it go away, but not really. So... We could look at this for a while. Again, we're we're working toward this. Isn't that crazy? Look at some of these little <sighs> The B component of M fifty one is eating the A component. This is the A component, M fifty one A. And it's being sucked in here and I don't know. It turned into cosmic schmoo, basically. All right, so that's done. Um, what just happened is it looked at the star, lined them all up. We can verify that with the add max command. This console uh, that I like to use for my commands is extremely primitive. Um, but, uh, you know, you can <laughs> copy and paste and change things if you're lazy and think it'll save you a couple of keystrokes. Always make sure to go all the way to the end before you hit enter because you need the little right echelon to precede all of your commands and it'll only create one if you end your command at the end. So again, running the add max to command just to verify that uh, nothing's gone crazy and, and then if we ran the uh, 
that menu command that I showed, uh, we should find that as we animate these frames and scroll around, nothing's moving. A little bit. Uh, this is a one-star alignment. This is extremely reliant on my polar alignment accuracy and other stuff like that, and it's actually just not perfect. But for the most part, as this steps through the frames here, you can see that, uh, you know, things aren't moving. So it passes the sanity check. That's all I'm looking for here. And now I can add them all up. I'm not going to do a, um, a, a median stack because that, um, in my opinion, really wastes a lot of, of, of data. I'm just going to add them all up with that old add to command. So frame 1 plus frame 2 plus frame 3. Add uh, each additional frame until it runs out of frames to add. Um, we'll sort of see what we got to look at here. Huh. So if I pull this top threshold slider up, Okay, so the cores are blown out, and I already knew this was going to happen. I'm feigning surprise here, uh, just to make another demonstration about something. But for the most part, you know, it looks pretty good. I mean, golly gee. Um, the cores are blown out, though, so if you didn't want to blow out the cores, you can make a slight modification of the add to command. Um which is the, well, let's just demonstrate first, the add norm to command. Uh, and try that. It oh, fails because we didn't select an image zone. So this is the area that we want to normalize the add. If it gets brighter than the sum of all pixels in all stacked images in that area, it will scale the stack so that nothing is blown out. I thank you all for your patience. You've been very patient to sit and, I don't know, sort of watch me uh, tinker and listen to me ramble. Um, and I hope you think uh, it's been worth your time and that this has been a bit enjoyable and maybe illuminating. This will be done soon. Iris, oh, it's already done. Iris goes out to lunch a lot, and it'll like show you like a little spinning wheel or something, or it'll say not responding. You just kind of have to just accept that you know, drive on. So I've added all these images together, and if I move the threshold slider all the way to the top, you'll find that it's been normalized to 32,700. The maximum value is 67 values above that, 32,767. So nothing is blown out, and if we look at the A component's core, you'll see that it's less than that because the B component core is brighter. So this one's only 25,222. Visualizing this, uh, linear data is tough. You know, this isn't a bad way to do it. You just kind of push the top one down and push the bottom one up. And then you, you know, you, well, you've blown the cores out, of course. All the way over here, um, way far away from the center, the core is blown out. So uh, if you were to look at the histogram, the distribution of the uh, the distribution of the brightness of the pixels as a function of all the pixels in the image. What you'll see is that we have a, a big peak. <laughs> we have over six hundred thousand, I guess whatever these density units are, of. extremely dim pixels and then a little bit of a tail down there and you know this is where it gets tricky about what you clip out and and then as far as the brighter values there's just not a whole lot it's all pretty concentrated here this might seem oddly timely that I'm discussing this but 
this brings us into a conversation about logarithmic curves and how to visualize a linear data set with a logarithmic visualization. And that's actually pretty simple. That's right here on the menu. You just go to view, same thing where you found like animate and there's some stuff with color images and merging where I found the histogram stuff. A slice, this is a fun one. You just kind of draw a slice through the through the image and it gives you a, a two-dimensional sort of plot. So you, here you can see how incredibly bright things get toward the center of the core of that galaxy with respect to how bright they are out in the arms. And that just makes it difficult for us to visualize on a uh, display with limited dynamic range and also the way our eyes work. The way our eyes work is logarithmically. Uh, uh, things that are much, much, much brighter don't seem nearly as bright to our eyes, and things that are incredibly dim seem much brighter. So dimmer things become brighter, and brighter things become dimmer when you express their visualization with logarithmic curves, which I'll do with one click. Right. So you'll see the background got much lighter, which had been super dark before. If I was to just look at the histogram now, well, that peak has been shifted, and it's fatter. Um, and now what I can do is I can kind of like pick an area like, I don't know, it could be 13,000. It could be about maybe maybe 19,000 or so. Um, and the easiest way to, use, to find that is to use the sliders and kind of look. Yeah, it looks like about 19,000. Maybe, I think that's safe. So, without really telling you everything that I'm going to do, I've just applied some logarithmic curves. I'm going to now reduce the overall brightness by applying a negative offset. Just going to use that same number that's in the bottom slider here for the threshold. Uh, negative, well, I'm going to use the negative version of that number. And I'm going to do that, bam, all that stuff's gone, and I have to kind of move the threshold sliders back down. And then I'm going to clip those negative values because if I type in statistics, you'll see that I have those negative values there. So I'll clip them again, and now if I type stat, those negative values are gone, and I'm going to do a log again, except this time I'm going to do it via the command line. It's the same thing. Just do I want to touch the mouse or type? doesn't. You know, sometimes for me, typing's faster. So two passes of logarithmic curves. And that's about 25,000. And my max here is 7,700. Multiplied by 4, that should be under 32,767. So I'm going to multiply every value of every pixel in this whole image by 4. Like that. And then that sort of makes everything brighter uniformly. Uh, there's probably a little more offset I could, I could do. A it's all, you know, now that, I see, I think that's a little bit too much. When I start seeing, uh, no, okay, it's fine. I second guess myself a lot when it comes to this stuff. 32 to about 1.3. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. There you go. Uh, we could, you know what, we can do that one more time. We'll do one more, one more set of log curves. And, yeah, it was a little bit too much. So I took it too far. Um, but that's okay. One thing I didn't uh, talk about that I did is I did apply a very slight set of wavelets to that image, which I'll go back to now. Every time... Uh, 
you know, I use Iris. It's a little bit of a different, a different experience because I kind of run by the seat of my pants. But uh, so there, I applied some slight wavelets to try to sharpen things up a bit. This didn't turn out as well as the reference image that I started with, but that's where we started. Uh, that was what I did before. Uh, that's kind of where we ended up. If we were to look at the histogram of this now, you know, wow, that's really flattened. <laughs> if we were to look at the histogram of this one, uh, which I did a lot better, you'll see that what I've done is I've uh, <coughs> flattened the curve, which used to be a peak up to in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands as a, a sharp peak has now become spread out and uh, um, made more visualizable in terms of the way our eyes work. And I think that's probably where I'll leave it for now. I, I appreciate you sticking with me for so long. This has been fun for me, and, and if you'd like, I would uh, be happy to make additional videos. If you have any questions uh, <laughs> or specific uh, requests, please talk about it in the comments and or hit me up on Facebook. You know who I am. We'll get there and make some more videos. Thanks again for watching. Take care.